Um, those of you that don't know me, I'm Ruth Holloway. I have been working as a Perl developer off and on as part of jobs for about 15 years now. Uh, I've been part of the, of the active Perl community for about five years. I didn't even know there was such a thing for the first four or five years I was using Perl. Uh, I had no idea. The, the system we were on, a lot of the scripts that automated stuff were written in Perl that I had inherited them, and so I learned Perl so that I could maintain those, and that was kind of what I did. I um, have been in IT for about 30 years. I was trying to figure out the other day when I got my first job making money with computers, and, and it was in 1985. Uh, I wasn't yet out of high school, and I was making money with programming. I was writing, believe it or not, an assembler. IBM 4381 assembler uh, was my first paying gig. Um, I've made money in seven different programming languages over the course of my career. Most recently, of course, with cPanel, I write a lot of Perl, and I tinker a little bit with JavaScript from time to time. Our UI stuff, mostly. Um, I've also done some work reasonably recently in PHP. Uh, more about bagging on PHP developers coming up shortly. Let's get close. Um, I did this talk last weekend for a conference on women in technology, advancing the careers of women in technology. It was a great conference, and a lot of folks in there were really new to IT. But, sorry guys, I see a lot of gray hair. <laughs> if you see hair at all. Thank you. Know, I'm just going to go there. If you did, yeah, I'm going there. Yeah. yeah. Um, how many of you have been in IT making money with tech for longer than 20 years? What's your excuse, Adam? Why'd you hand up? I'm not in IT. Uh, I don't make money in tech. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, so some of this history that I'm going to talk about. I, there's a little bit of a recap of history I want to talk about today to kind of set the stage for the point at the end. And some of this may be old news for some of you that are old hands like me that have been at it a long time. Uh, and some of it may surprise you. Um, I will warn you, however, there's a lot of text ahead on the slides. Don't worry about it. The slides are shared. Um, and, of course, you can see the recording online and all that if you want to recap. I, I did want to, you know, preparing for this was a, bit of a thing for me. I walked down memory lane. Of course, for me, I also noticed the house at 8K um, because my first computer had 8K in memory. Sawyer's, thank you. And this is why he's the pump king. And this is why he's the pump king. Uh -huh. He's the one who solves all the problems. Thank you. Okay, the earliest computers as we think of them, were, were large electromechanical devices. In 1932, Conrad Zeus built the Z2 using, a, it had a whole bunch of electromechanical parts. Incredibly noisy, it was, the Z3 was built in 1941, and it was actually programmable using a punched film, very similar to punched tape, about that wide. It had 64 22-bit words of memory. That's all. Um, and it was the first computer, the Z3 was, from 41, was the first computer that could calculate using floating point numbers. Um, the earliest computers were all one-off constructs. They were unique entities built one copy at a time by hand. Um, this would make them incredibly expensive. They were also massive, as some of you are, I'm sure are aware. And the first totally electronic digital machine was the ABC in 1942, and it was designed to solve systems of linear equations, and it was not programmable at all. Um, it had no programmability the way we think of the term today. Uh, the Colossus in 1944 was built to uh, decode messages, and it was sent to Bletchley Park, and it was the first digital programmable all-electronic machine. It had 1,500 tubes in it. And the Mark II, they, they figured out after a year or so of running this thing that they could upgrade it by adding more tubes. And it had 2,400 tubes. They built nine Mark IIs. This was the first multiply produced computer. And they upgraded the Mark I. When they upgraded from 1,500 to 2,400 tubes, 
they gave a five-fold speed increase to the computer. Now, this is still calculation that's just barely above the speed that you and I could do it by hand. But it could do it day and night without rest and without sleep, where we cannot. Um, Post-World War II, we started to see more development in the States, and uh, ENIAC was the first large machine built in the States, 1946, and it was the first computer that implemented code branching. That was not a thing prior to that. Um, it could be programmed with a paper tape. Hmm? My alma mater. Yeah. Um, it used these frames, these massive rolling blocks of switches and tubes to add new functionality, including new memory. Uh, by 1956, when they shut it down, it had 17,468 tubes, 7,200 diodes, 70,000 resistors, and approximately 5 million hand-soldered joints. Um, and it weighed 30 tons. And when they spun it up, lights dim for blocks around. Um, the Manchester Mark I of the Manchester Automatic Digital Machine in 1949 was a prototype for the Ferranti Mark I, which led to the IBM uh, 701 and 702 and 650, the first commercial multiply produced machines. Uh, the Ferranti Mark I was the first computer that could program a game. It could solve chess problems. However, because it had extremely limited memory, you could only program made in two chess problems with no castling, no double pawn move, no emphasis, no pawn promotion, and no distinction between checkmate and tailor. <laughs> so somewhat limited in its capabilities to play the game. Uh, the Mark I and its, and its children, the IBM 701 and 702, had 2,048 words of 36 feet each. You could double that memory for an additional $100,000. Uh, the Univac 1 was the first commercial computer produced in the U.S. by Rington Rand. It booted up the first time in March of 1951. The company that produced that after a series of, of dinosaur mergers was, is Unisys, and they're still around, and they still sell computers that are based on that design. Obviously of much larger capacity. In 1955, the transistor began replacing the tube, and we had the first fully transistorized machine in the Harwell Cadet, an otherwise undistinguishable machine. Uh, integrated circuits started replacing these solid-state components throughout the 60s, but that was not done all at once, not like the transistor replacing the tube, because it wasn't a one-to-one -one replacement. You had to build integrated circuits that designed around replacing a board full of parts. And so it was discovered that doing this in embedded systems was really very cost-effective and very uh, useful. So uh, obviously the military took a big swing at that, and spaceflight benefited a lot from that sort of thinking. But in 1971, the microprocessor changed the rules of the game. Prior to that, all computers, going all the way back to those electromechanical ones in the 30s, were designed basically the same way. The microprocessor changed all of that because all of a sudden this little tiny chip can do all the work and it has branching instructions in it. And so vast amounts of work could happen on this one little chip, relatively speaking, and that changed the design of computers completely. Now, what was the first programming language? If anybody says Perl, I'm gonna we're gonna talk. All right. <laughs> have words after this. No. Code. Machine code, yeah. Well, machine code, hand machine code, yes, but the first Compilable programming language, modern language, the way you think of assembly, assemblers, assembler. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm, I'm talking high level languages. Fortran, COBOL, Fortran, Lisp, APL, APL. A lot of people outside the industry say COBOL. The media has kind of perpetuated that, but it wasn't. It was Fortran. Uh huh. Um, 1954, the specification was developed for Fortran came out of IBM. The first compiler was for the 701, and that was the first optimizing compiler, the way we think of those today. Uh, by 1960, there were four other implementations available, and by 63, there were over 40 implementations of Fortran available. We realize every one of those was programmed in machine code for the machine it was made for, by hand. Um, and now that's still in use. 
um, I, I work in Houston, and NASA is right down the road, and they still hire Fortran programmers from time to time. Blows me away when I see those ads. Like, what? In the early days of the human film monitors, we had a guy who worked, who was an astronomer. Oh, yeah. worked at Hayden Planetarium, and, and he liked Pearl, so he came to our meetings, but he worked in Fortran. He worked in Fortran, yeah. And if you want to crunch like, big numbers, it's, it's like really hard to find a better one. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Made money in Fortran. Don't oh, make money. Uh, no. I programmed in Fortran and made money. Yeah. Fortran, of course, influenced a lot of languages that came afterwards. Every time you see influence C, then you're seeing influence Perl. Because there's a lot of structures in C that influence Perl, and there's a lot of behavior, and we'll see that a lot. But a lot of languages were influenced by Fortran. Mumps. Have they ever worked in Mumps? Thank you. You and I both. Okay, Mumps was one of the first database languages prior to SQL being a thing. Um, it was a database management system for uh, PDP-11, PDP-8 before that, and and it was really useful for managing large databases. And the medical industry kind of latched onto it, and they still use it. Hmm? Yeah, it is a neat name, though. All right. So was COBOL the second language? No. No, that would be Lisp. All right. Lisp gave us practical mathematical notation for computers. So it was really easy to use. And it was grabbed onto very quickly by the early AI researchers. A lot of folks early on in the thought about AI found that Lisp was really useful for expressing what they wanted to do. It is the first dynamically typed functional language. Um, the first implementation was for the IBM 704 in 1958. The first complete compiler that was implemented in the own, in its own language in 1962. And it was the first one to do that, first language where you could do that. Many implementations are still maintained. There are still a number of dialects of lists that are still in use. Closure scheme, common list. Some of you have made money with that. I heard somebody talking about common list earlier today. And it influenced a vast number of languages many of which are probably familiar to you right here. So was COBOL the third programming language? No. No, that would be Algol. Um, it was written for the Z22 computer in December of 1958. Uh, IBM took a swing at it, but they were already making money with Fortran, so they couldn't really be bothered with another new language. Uh, they were making a lot of money on Fortran at that point because they'd been running it for a couple of years. Um, so they abandoned their implementation. There were problems in the specification that came up during that process, so it was upgraded to Algol 60, and today if you talk about Algol, you're talking about Algol 60. 58 compilers just don't exist anymore. And it introduced the notion of code blocks. This is the first language that had explicit blocks of code with begin and end wrapped around them, which then, of course, influenced most every imperative language that followed, including C and Pascal and Perl and and Ada and name it. Yeah, every one of them that uses begin end blocks learned that from Algol 58. So, anybody know who the lady is sitting at the desk here? Grace Hopper. I see a lot of blank looks. It's you. And David get No, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> we have words later. Uh, <laughs> maybe this picture will help. Grace Hopper. It was Grace Hopper, yes. Rear Admiral Dr. Grace Murray Hopper, United States Navy. All right. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow in my keynote. But the guy who says women are not suited for engineering genetically, I wish she was still alive. Because she would flay the skin right off of that kid. Right? That's, seriously. Um, in 1949, she joined the UNIVAC development team, and she pushed the idea that you could create a computer language that spoke English, that used English words to program a computer. And she was told very quickly to sit down and shut up. You can't do this because computers don't understand English. English is too complicated a language. 
Grace Hopper being Grace Hopper, ignored their advice and in a couple of years released the A0 system language, which was the first compiler, as we think of the term, that was more like a modern linker. And its subsequent development led to B0, which was released as Flowmatic in 1955, which was the first English language-like data processing language. It's a transaction processing system, which then led, of course, to COBOL. Uh, the Defense Department wanted, had all these different machines, and a lot of them were one-offs and hand constructions, and, and they wanted a language that could be used across all of them for data processing. And so they convened a group of people who were involved in programming languages, and Grace Hopper was one, one member of that team because she was the only member of that team at that time who had a commercially released compiler that used English terms. As there only was one Flowmatic at that point. Um, the first compiled program ran August 17, 1960 on an RCA 501. They ran the same code, the same source file, four months later on a Univac which satisfied the military, and by 1970, COBOL was the most widely used language in the world. Throughout the 60s and 70s, we refined the art. Now, some of you may have started your careers toward the end of this time, and we shan't pick on your old age at this point, but I was small at this point. But in 1962, array programming, that was new. 1964, the first language designed for students, BASIC. Like its successor, Pascal, as a teaching language, it escaped into the wild and people actually wrote production code with that. And, and everybody is still stunned by that. The first job I had kind of full time in system administration, when I crashed one of the client programs, the applications that we bought from a vendor, um, the VAX told me that BASIC was the facility that was being used to run it. And I went, BASIC? Mm -hmm. They wrote this thing in BASIC? So I told my bosses I could speed it up by a factor of three just by changing language and not gain any functionality at all. They wouldn't let me do it. Please. 1967, the first language to support object-oriented programming. Like Perl 5, it was not object-native. It just supported you could do this thing, kind of. Um, C, of course, we all know about that one. Pascal in 1970, heavily structured, was really good for teaching language. This was the language that was taught in college when I started college in 1986. Uh, Small Talk, 72, the first fully object oriented language. That one was object native. And Prolog in 72, the first logic programming language. All of these are still in use various places, small numbers. Pascal. Um, Some people are still using Pascal. So yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's production code. This, you know, this is another one of those that escaped into the wild that never should have. But there's okay. still Pascal code out there. And I, I, I know a couple of developers who maintain that stuff. But it's good, but that's mostly legacy code. Legacy code, yeah. Fine. Nobody's doing new development in that. So people still code on Windows. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. In the 80s, innovation, standardization, we tried to converge somewhat in programming languages. Um, 1980, ADA, which was mentioned earlier, at that point, the Defense Department was speaking over 450 different languages. And they said, this is crazy. And so they wanted one language to rule them all, one language to bind them, okay. one language to bring them. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and it mostly worked, although that migration was still happening by like the, the early 2000s, they were still migrating systems to ADA. Uh, Postscript in 1982, we started seeing laser printers in particular that could do a lot more graphics and a lot more interesting things than the old dot matrix printers could do. And we needed a standard language to describe those pages. Postscript fit the need. MATLAB commercial package for letting you do number crunching without learning Fortran. That's still sold. In fact, they still advertise on NPR from time to time. C++, extended C, and Perl. We all know about that. I don't need to talk about that. And there have been so many other languages since then. There are over 8,000 programming languages that have run code at some point or another. 
the noteworthy list of important computer languages on, on uh, Wikipedia has over 700 languages. Uh, some of which are derivatives of each other, sure. But yeah, 700 languages. Can you learn them all? Why would you want to? Let's talk about dead languages. I hear this term every now and then. It just kind of makes me itch. So let's get a working definition of what is a dead language. I spent some time thinking about this, and I hope we can kind of all buy this. It's not taught anywhere. That's a good start. There's no or very, very few new devs popping up to continue maintenance work on existing code. Um, no vendors, no open source communities that are maintaining compilers or interpreters. No new developments in language standards or functionality, and little to no production code. Is that a pretty good definition? I see some, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll work with this for the minute. Cobalt dead? No, no, no. Okay, we all know better. It's funny when I do this in front of the muggles because they go, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> that's that 60 year old language. Yeah, it's dead. No, it's not. And I tell them, you got a debit card in your pocket? And they go, oh yeah, everybody's got it. They pull it out. I said, swipe it 10 times today. By midnight, seven of those transactions will have been touched by Cobalt code anywhere in the world. Doesn't matter. What? Really? Yeah. Is Cobalt dead? Not at all. It's not taught in school. There's very few new developers coming out. Tell you what, if you want to make a lot of money, learn COBOL. Learn COBOL. Yeah. Every COBOL dev I know, and I know, I don't know, a dozen or so, every one of them is making six digits. They're making piles of money for very lightweight work. This is really not hard because those systems have been working. They don't need a lot of maintenance. They don't need a lot of TLC, and they just work, and they need somebody on tap in case it breaks. There's a lot of money. It, this, is the, this is the story of consulting. If you can't be part of the solution, there is considerable money to be made in prolonging the problem. <laughs> but there is newish development in COBOL. Ah, whoa, yeah. Microfocus, Microfocus still sells a compiler for COBOL for a number of different machines, and version 2.3 came out a couple of years ago. New COBOL is still under development at its glacial pace. They have been forever working on 1.1 1 .1 and it finally came out. And so 1.2 is still glacially sliding forward, but they're hoping to get to the upgraded 2014 standard for COBOL. There is in fact a new COBOL standard, which includes object-oriented classes and dynamic capacity tables. Who knew? Wow, you know. And of course, as I mentioned a minute ago, there's a ton of production code. I don't think you can truly say that any language or any X here is completely dead. If there's one system still running this, and if it's Algol, there's embedded systems still using that stuff. List, there's still work going on in List. Fortran, these languages do not actually die. They fall off the bottom of the popular list. Sure, so is Perl in many ways. But do languages ever really die? I don't, I don't really think so. I don't think you can safely say that. One of my earliest jobs was uh, working on the handcraft assembler for a BCPL compiler. Mm -hmm. um, I've not heard at any point, including at the time, I, I would think that would. I'm convinced it must exist somewhere, but yeah, I've never heard of it. Yeah, some nook and cranny somewhere is running even those languages, <laughs> even the ones that were niches to start with. That you know, like my, one of the when I was in college, because I, I'm kind of a natural polyglot, I soak up programming languages really easily. So I was a favorite lab instructor for programming language labs. You could take one credit hour programming language labs, and you had an hour a week with a professor and, an, and two hours a week in a, in a lab to learn a programming language, and it was a one credit thing, and, and a number of people I knew took these things. Well, I was kind of a favorite for as soon as I took it, then I could teach it. So I taught Pascal, Fortran, Basic, um, C, Modula 2, which is one not many people have heard of. That was a teaching language. Um, Newt didn't like what he did in Pascal, so he pulled a Larry Wall and wrote Modula 2, um, only he did it faster. Um, 
several in COBOL. I did teach COBOL labs for the business school. So there's a few of those languages that were kind of Nietzsche to begin with that may not still exist in the wild, but there's probably some hobbyist who enjoyed the heck out of that thing who's still playing with it just for fun. Is it truly dead? Commercially viable? No. Dead? That's a questionable term, and I don't think we'll ever really get a firm answer. I talked a little while ago about Dagenham Field. I was at Salt Lake City for the North American Pro Conference a couple of years ago. Yeah, three years ago now, I guess. And there was a group of developers sitting around the table, Pearl Dev, and they were bagging on PHP and on PHP developers. And finally, after about an hour of listening to this, somebody had presence of mind to say, Gosh, I wonder if PHP devs bag on us as much as we bag on them. And I said, yes, we do. <laughs> and there was this long, stunned silence. And they realized just how offensive and nasty they had been for the last hour. And I had let them do it. Well, they did that. Python people don't do that. Python people consider themselves above such nonsense. <laughs> Fine, but... Hating on computer languages, I, 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 I have a coworker, and I love the man dearly. I truly do. He's, he's one of the people that I treasure in my life. But he hates on every programming language there is, including Perl, even though he writes a lot of Perl. You know who I'm talking about. Um, so much so that he's designing a new language, and it's solved all the problems that all these other languages come up with. And I'm like, OK, Don Quixote. <laughs> Let's talk, because you know this is a pointless endeavor. You know he's not going to ever actually solve all the problems. He's just going to solve the ones that annoy him. Maybe, eventually, in the fullness of time, you know, 16 years on, we get Pearl 6, right? I don't really think, part of this is just me, OK? I use the word hate so rarely that when I used it Scrabble once, the other people I was playing with noticed it. Because I just don't use that word. It, it, it has a meaning for me, and it has a meaning that is so intense that I cannot do it. I can't do that verb. Just like jealous, I can't do it. It's divisive. It alienates people that are in the same business you are. Look, we're all in the same business, right, Code? That makes people's lives better. That's what we do, right? Right? Right. 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 Now, now, some of that is kind of tedious and indirect. When you're writing unit tests, that's not making your end user's life better, except in the sense that you're not letting bugs out the door. Okay, fine. But we try to write code that improves our world, that solves problems. Our problems or somebody else's problems doesn't matter. We're trying to write code to solve problems. Look, the people that are programming in PHP or COBOL even, or any of these other languages, they're doing the same thing. They just happen to have a different toolkit than you do. Have you ever seen a mechanic who uses Snap-on bagging on a mechanic who uses some other brand of tool? No, it's silly. A wrench is a wrench. Why do we do it? Question? Hmm? Why do you uh, make the definition of a language because you did, uh, disposed of assembly as not being mobile? Well, it's not a high-level language, but it is a language. What, the, the, the for, for this discussion, anyway, including yeah. the lower level, yeah. it's also a language. Yeah, of course, there's also a language. Assembler is also a language. All of these computer languages, even at the low level, I find some developers who get cranky about this language or that. I'm not just talking about high level here. When I was talking about high level languages, that was a separate thing. But there's no perfect language for there's, program. Right, and I'm going to mention that a bit. Um, there, there seems to be not a Distinct um, line here between hating on languages and hating on people. And they might be both behavior. That there are lots of languages that I dislike. I, I think hate is a very strong word. That's right. right. But that doesn't mean that I have anything bad to say about people that use that language or right. people who choose. And I don't. I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I think. And again, if hate is a strong word for you, then that's probably a good thing. There are languages I choose not to try to solve some problems with. There are some problems for which COBOL is a really dismally bad language. 
Yes, somebody has written a web framework for COBOL. Why? Because they can. <laughs> Does that make sense to use it instead of Dancer? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Not at all. Like writing Can't screen it. editor in It would annoy Max so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so there. <laughs> I am down for that. This is this is a problem that needs solution. We need to annoy Matt more. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> I actually have worked in. I, I worked with a guy that wrote a bunch of uh, COBOL web front end stuff. And the reason was is the Perl and Visual Basic and whatever else developers need to get to the data that was on the mainframe, they do run uh, you know, so much time. Uh, and that was pathway. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there's, and, and hating on developers, I actually see people who do hate on developers. Many don't. They bag on the language without bagging on the developers, and that's fine, to a point. I think that's kind of closed-minded thinking myself. There are some languages that I don't care for much. I didn't care for Fortran very much. I have no love for it. It is painful, and when I was writing Fortran, it couldn't do recursion. <laughs> this was Fortran 77, and you couldn't do recursion in Fortran, which frustrated me no end because I love writing routines with the curse. It works well for me. You were lucky that you had this modern Fortran 77. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. I had a modern compiler. Yeah. Um, there are languages I don't like very much. I, I think hating on is a strong word. I'm with you on that. But I hear people who rage and carry on about languages a lot, and that frustrates me. And even more so when they're also raging on the developers who use that language. I think that's really uncalled for. It's over the line for me. Because it treats developers as inferior because of the toolkit they're choosing to use. It's probably artificially generated. Look, those people are just as serious at what they're doing as you are about yours. They're trying to solve problems the same as you are. They're working on the same stuff. What do you got? Um, I would uh, draw the strongest line, uh, not uh, between hate or not, but um, if how it performed this is I spoke with several people who have strong anti-feeling around Pearl, but don't know as much. They just repeat other people's opinion. Exactly. That That's the, what I'm saying here. That is, it's, it's artificial. Yeah, but this is to me even worse than have a feed, actual feature with what I experience and I don't like it. It's my reason and it's my feeling. Right. That's exactly. more valid. Most of the hatred, most of the people who hate the hardest have never actually used the language they're hating on very much. Right? They certainly haven't used it enough to exercise its capabilities well. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, too. They've, they've played with it a little bit, or, or they've read some press, and based on that, they just kind of parrot this rage that they've heard from somewhere else. It's artificial. Now, if you've used Fortran and have good reasons not to like using Fortran, because it can't do X, Y, or Z, that's fine. That means you've made the sense of the tool. You're using the tool and figuring out what it can't can do. The thing about PHP that I love the most is inline. You can just do it right in the middle of the web page and it just does it. It's just it's great. I love that part. Lots of other languages could do that. I just happened to have written a plugin for WordPress all oh, five or six years ago. That interacted with a thing that's no longer around, Google Reader, so you know it's kind of a worthless plugin now. But the learning experience was really good for me. It is rude and disrespectful, particularly if it's this artificially generated anger about languages or developers. We put a lot of passion into Perl. How many of you paid your own way to get here? Your employer did not. That tells me you're at least a little bit passionate about Perl. Cool. Now, if you're local, well, <laughs> okay, whatever. But every, every time I'm in front of a Perl group of people and I, I ask that question, I get a lot of hands. People pay their own good money to come and be around other Perl people. Don't you think that PHP devs have the same passion for what they do? Probably. Hmm? I have no idea, to be honest. Maybe you ought to go meet some, Doug. Why am I having to tell adults this? 
this is a this is a indirect way of me saying this kind of raginess that is especially the unfounded stuff, especially against developers personally, is really childish. Why am I having to tell adults this? Aren't we bigger than that? We should be. So how many of you program in one language only? Okay, well, you know. David, you're just a special case all the time. And, yeah. You know, but we love you. Well, profile is all 62 different languages. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you routinely make money doing some language other than Perl 5 or Perl 6? Mm -hmm. Pretty good number. So you already know what I'm going to be talking about when I talk about why you ought to learn more. Um, as you pointed out, there is no one perfect tool for all problems. Uh, Fortran 77 sucks if you need to do factorial calculations because it cannot recurse. It is possible to figure out how to do it. It was considered a difficult problem. If you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And then you write these really bad programs that kind of sort of solve the problem. The first library automation system I dealt with as a system administrator was written by a librarian who learned basic. Yeah, that's what I said too. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was, uh, librarians loved it. It was the most popular library automation system in, certainly in the Western Hemisphere for quite a while. And then they got bought out by another company and so on and so on, as happened. But it was incredibly popular because the librarians loved it. System administrators, however, and people who really got technology, pulled their hair out over it, which is why I wear wigs now. You're learning to think differently. If you have PHP and Perl in your toolkit, for instance, or Python and Perl, or Python and PHP and Perl, or add some of the other languages, pick a couple. You approach problems differently. And you realize you've got more than one choice. Again, let's go back to the mechanics thing. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, even when you really need a screwdriver. The curious one is I read viral code. I saw people writing C differently as a result. <laughs> it can improve other languages to know how to program in a second language. But I already knew both languages. It made me think about C differently. Made you think about C differently. Made you think about Perl differently, I'm sure, too. So you go beyond Perl, PHP, Python, which are all kind of similar languages. Do some list, do some prologue. So right. Makes you think about that. Uh, you know, Tickle. Very differently. Do something. Small do something. Part. Some people Small are part. short sighted. Yeah. On Perl Monks, I have uh, <coughs> an article that I said Perl 6 grew up, it's, it has a speed up of 10% overnight. And uh, it's still not on production speed, but I learned a lot from the language. Right. Then someone started bashing on that it's still too slow. Still too slow. That's not my point. That's not the point. The point is it got faster overnight. And then I learned a lot. From the and, and I learned something. Yeah. yeah. Investing in your skill set. Um, in 2012, Graythorn in the UK did a, a survey of developers and they discovered for each language you know above the first, you can gain about three to 10,000 pounds worth of money annually. Uh, so several thousand dollars a year increase in salary, up to about six languages. And if you're fluent in six, well, you're probably in research. Right, that's okay. <coughs> and you're on a different scale. Completely. Okay, I've heard it said a zillion, zillion times in the last five years, what makes Pearl go is the people. It's not about the language. The language is a language like lots of other languages. And as you point out, it's not too dissimilar from Python and PHP and many of its features. What makes Perl happen, what makes Perl awesome, is the people sitting in this room and the room next to us and the room across the hall, right? People. If you get into the PHP community or even, you know, God help you, the COBOL community, you're going to meet interesting people. That's a big hunk of why I'm so excited to be at my first European Pearl conference. I mean, I've been going to the to the North American one for the last five years. This is my first time in Europe ever. And I'm like, I'm like all about meeting people. 
sending my husband a dozen pictures a day of new people I've met because this is, this is what I live for. It's about meeting people. But which one? There are so many. I hear the whine and then they walk away and continue bagging on other languages besides their primary. Here's some choices. It kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, you know, this, and these are not the right answer, the absolute only right answer in any of those cases. Uh, you can do some really nice web applications with uh, Perl or Python if you want to. You can do um, Windows desktop applications with other languages besides C Sharp. There's plenty of other choices. This is a suggestion that I found online. Just kind of a thought of what language to learn. It was kind of a discussion thread. I don't even remember. I think it may have been a Reddit thread. The people were just kind of throwing ideas out. Well, that's on my to-do list. Okay. A lot of things. It's embedded in all kinds yeah. of scripting. Yeah. yeah. There's, this was just one set of choices. There were lots of others. Um, but these are the ones that I, I kind of spotted as common things people were talking about. All right. How do you go about doing this? I need to finish in the next few minutes. Um, books. Hey, we all know about O'Reilly. We know those guys. They always put good books out for learning things. Um, there's a lot of hands-on tools. Have any of you used either of these? Yeah, you and I, I know. Exorcism supports 31 languages right now, with 20 more upcoming and six in planning. And Perl is not one of those. Hence, hence, we're all volunteers, someone said. Um, and they have a, a collection of common problems to solve, which you can solve in your language, and then your peers decide how well you did it. Um, Hacker Rank is a lot more gamified. Um, it's got challenges, there's coding games to play, there's uh, contests from time to time, and they sort of currently support 49 languages. That does include Pro 5 and Pro 6. Um, college courses, if you're near a college or university and it's a modern language that they're currently teaching, Going and auditing a class is not the worst way to learn if that works for you. Find your learning style. You notice there's at least three different learning styles here. I learn by reading a book. I learn by doing it. I learn by hearing someone else talk about it. Okay. Do what works for you. Um, find other people's code and look it over. If that works for you, do it. Um, you, you, you mentioned but didn't have on the slide doing it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Particularly if you've already got a couple of languages under your belt, just picking up another language and trying to write something in it with man page to hand is often it is a way that works really well. Mm -hmm. Another way to learn it is either I'm in the process to make some videos for Udemy or there are other portals. YouTube made books as well. They are pretty good to online tutorials. Sure, online tutorials. Those are out there. Language conversions. I learned Perl by using Off to Perl. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we won't hold it against you much. <laughs> but when do you put it on your resume and start, you know, getting that extra money that comes from knowing another language? That's tough. Do I consider myself fluent in JavaScript or PHP? No. I'm comfortable in both languages. When a problem comes to my team that involves UI stuff, I'm more comfortable than my teammates at working at those problems. When it comes to PHP stuff, he's more comfortable than I am. Brett, right? He get PHP my admin stuff. He's been hacking on that forever, it seems like. Get comfortable with the language. Now that may mean different things for different people or different languages. Know how to use the tool chain. Look, if you're messing with Python, you need to understand PIP. If you're doing anything in Perl, you need to understand CPAN, at least have some idea of how it functions. How to consume from it, if nothing else. And an understanding of how things go into it probably won't hurt you. Understanding the strengths and the weaknesses of the language. This used to be more pronounced than it is now. It used to be COBOL couldn't do object-oriented and COBOL couldn't do the web. Now it can. This is less of a problem than it used to be, but it's still out there. There are some languages that are wordy than other, wordier than others. And if you don't like typing a lot of words, don't learn COBOL. You're going to type your fingers to the bone, and that's what they do. 
being able to read others' code, there used to be, I haven't looked lately, a tool on GitHub for finding code based on what language it's in. So you can find projects that are based in that language and go read others' code. Hey, you might find some <laughs> project you're interested in contributing to. Uh, volunteer, Larry says. For getting it onto your resume, being familiar with or comfortable with might be enough depending on the job you're going into. Don't oversell yourself and say, oh, I'm fluent in JavaScript, when you're not. Go ahead and say, you know, I've done some JavaScript and I'm pretty comfortable with it, at least maintaining other people's code. If I was gonna have to design something from scratch, that would be harder. But I'd, I'd love to try. So find the sweet spot for you, and that's gonna vary. I, I know people who, to get comfortable with a language, have to spend six months on that. I can't. <laughs> yeah. And that's okay. But learning a second language or a third or a fourth or more, how many of you routinely make money in three or more? Pearl five and Pearl six distinct. Three or more. Uh -huh. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. So go out and do that because it'll benefit you a lot. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your patience and I love the input from all of you. Thanks very much. Good day.